So I love watching movies. Movies is uh, one of the ways I kind of unwind and kind of escape from reality. Uh, it, it's, it's nice to get immersed into a film so much where you forget that it's even a movie and you're, you're kind of like, you're really invested with uh, the characters. And so I love TV as well for the same reason, especially now we're like in the golden age of TV because the character development, and you can't probably hear that a lot from a lot of people. They're like, man, the character development in this show is so good. But there's something that happens that always takes me out and it always draws me out from that character development. I don't even care how good the movie is, how good the show is, is that when, when this one thing happens, I, it just ruins it all for me. It always ruins, especially when it's the main character. I, I, even if I'm su supposed to like that person, if they do this, I just, I'm done. And it's when, it's when the protagonist, the main character, when they cheat on their significant other, I'm done. I, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much the story is about, how, how, how wonderful the progression is. It's like once the main character begins to cheat on their significant other, sometimes I have to turn it off. And I remember there was this one movie that came out a long time ago, and it was a chick flick, and it was, it was people loved it. They, 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 they were just raving about ranting. I won't say it because I know uh, some, of the, some of the women in here will be like, that's my favorite movie. How dare you ruin it? So I won't even say what movie it is. But basically the way the movie goes is that there's this, this girl and this guy. They fall in love, and then they break up, and uh, the girl ends up being engaged to someone else, and he's like the perfect guy, but she still loves the guy. He, she still loves her first, her first love. And, and so what ends up, even though she's engaged this super awesome guy, and he, he's like, he's really cool, and he's, he's, he's a good dude, he's, her parents like him and everything, she ends up cheating on him with this, this fool. And I'm like, in the whole movie, I'm like, I know I'm supposed to root for you guys, but like, how dare you? How dare you cheat on, on your fiance? And I, I was kind of going through it, and I was like, Man, how, and then we left the movie theater, and we, like, after we watched it, I, I don't even remember when it came out, but I remember after watching it again, um, like, the girls in, in our group of friends, they were like, oh my God, that was the most romantic movie I've ever seen in my life. They're crying. They're like, oh, it's so sweet. And I, I, I was just sitting there, and I was, I was like, me, I'm very opinionated. I was like, no, that movie was terrible. That was the worst. Like, how, how can you say that's the most romantic movie? She cheated on her fiance. Like, what are you guys talking about? Like, no, you don't understand. You don't, know, you don't get romance. Like, this is it's so romantic. Like, she, lo she loved him, and, and he loved her. And I'm like, but he, he, was, he was doing things with another girl. She was engaged with someone else, and then they both cheated. And, and, and you guys are saying this is a good thing? They're like, yeah, the best movie ever. <laughs> Honestly, it was one of those times where I felt a little crazy, but I think it was just, it's a matter of perspective. I understand. I, I get it. I get why, why people like the movie. People like it because it's, it's sweet and all, all these different things. But I think from my perspective, I was like, how, how, could, how, could, you ever, how could you ever condone that? And I, I'm not like the, the Bible-thumbing type of person, but I was like, you know, if someone cheated on me like that, like there is no way that it would, it would be a happy story. Like that's, that's, that's sad. How, like what joy is there in that? But I, I get the perspective. Because at the end of the day, they're like, but they were meant to be. Like, they're meant to be. They're star-crossed lovers. They're, 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 that's how it's supposed to be. So, so it doesn't matter how you get there. As long as you get there, like how great that is. I understand it. But at the end of the day, I think from, again, my perspective, I think it's wrong. And I, I say it's wrong. And I say that with conviction, that it's, it's not a gray issue. It's black and white. It's wrong that you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be unfaithful to the person that you've, you've said you should be faithful to. The book of Lamentations, it's a book I've never preached on before because it's exactly that. It's a book of lament. lament. It's a book of sorrow. In, 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 the, in the Hebrew, the word that they, they use to title this is the word how, like how. And, and, and it's like, how could this be? Like, how could this have happened? And, and, and the, the book describes in poetic form the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, that the empire of Babylon, and, and Babylon is this huge empire, it's, 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 it's ginormous, it's far-reaching, super powerful, and you know, it's, it's the, same, uh, the same type of empire that you kind of see in the movies that these great armies that they come in and they just destroy an entire city, that the empire of Babylon has come in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And, and what the book of Lamentations is, it's, it's kind of in poetic form describing what it's like to be destroyed. 
what it's like to go through this kind of turmoil, of despair. And it's not a happy book. That's why it's called Lamentations. That's why it's about lament. It's sad. But there's a lot of truth inside the book of Lamentations because of the type of perspectives that we gain from the book itself. And so would you open up your, your Bibles with me or look on the screen behind me to the book of Lamentations. It's right after the book of Jeremiah because it's written by the prophet Jeremiah. And I, 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 I want to preface this by saying, because it's all about perspective, as we read this first section, and I'm going to kind of skip around because it's the whole chapter. Feel free to read the whole chapter. It's a, it's a great poem. It's a great uh, description of what's going on. But we're looking at it from an, like an outside perspective, how an observer is seeing what's going on, of the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people, the city of Jerusalem. How, and this is an a, 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 a image that we're going to be using, a simile, but really a metaphor. How like a widow she has become. She who was, a great, was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. Verse 2. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, and that word lovers is going, to be, is going to be important, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. We're going to skip to verse 5. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. The Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. Verse 8. Jerusalem sinned grievously, therefore she became filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Not a very pretty sight. What it's doing, this, this way that this is describing, it's personifying the city as a woman. And, and the way it begins is explained this woman is in this distress and she's mourning. She's crying in her, in her pillow. She's crying in her bed because all of her lovers have left. All of her lovers are gone. She's now alone. And, and, and with all these lovers being gone, her friends who were once friends have now turned to be treacherous against her. They begin to backstab her. And again, just imagining the, the, the pain of this woman, the pain of this woman who had all of these lovers, all of these friends now all of her lovers are gone and all of her friends are become enemies that when we talk about someone crying in their bed i can totally understand why i feel for her she who was once popular well liked well esteemed who probably wore really nice clothes and and and, and was able to be to be shown to be seen who, who probably had, you know, that, that cute boyfriend always on her side, that really muscular dude who was, who was always there to kind of validate the fact that, yeah, you are beautiful. Look, look at the kind of lovers that you have. Look at the kind of guys that are, that are with you, that she has this, and she's the kind of girl that she walks into, walks into just any room, and she's all these friends who, who want to get to know her. And now, those lovers are gone. Those friends are now enemies, talking behind her back, talking probably in front of her face, calling her bad names, doing all these things. And she's weeping, crying, bitter tears. And, and, and the way that this outside observer is looking in, oh man, it's so hard. The way he says it is this. It's the Lord who's afflicting you because of your transgressions. Because of all the sin that you've been doing, the Lord is the one who is putting you in your place. Ooh. And I can imagine her tears probably became even more fierce, more violent, knowing that it is God who is punishing her because she has been living in sin. She ha is filthy. She's broken. See, we, we, could, we could beat around the bush. But this happens to us all the time. 
This happens to us in various, in, in different degrees, in different ways, in which we, we are this woman. We are the one where we're, we're on cloud nine. Everything is going well. Everything we touch seemingly, seemingly turns into gold. Everything is going well. Everything is going great. And we're also, we also empathize and understand when things go poorly, when it seems like everything we touch just dies and becomes poison. And we begin to rationalize and think to ourselves, when things are going well, it's because I'm, I'm doing a good job, I'm doing great. And when things go bad and things go poorly, it's because I am sinful, I am transgressing, I am doing poorly. I'm a bad person. I'm terrible. That's why I deserve all of this. I deserve all of this pain because I'm not good. And when we do well, I deserve this. I deserve the blessings because I'm good. I've done well. I'm smart. I'm a hard worker. And it's in this paradigm of good and bad, of success and failure that we constantly live in, that we constantly are in, that from the outside it looks like the people who aren't being destroyed, that God is favoring you. God is blessing you. God is with you. And so you're going to do well. Good job. And when the people experience turmoil, and they experience destruction, God is the one doing this to you because you are sinful and you are wrong and and you need to to repent. You You need to repent and turn from your wicked ways and when you do, then God will restore you. We've heard this in the church time and time again. And it becomes a very public thing. And that's why perspective is very important because perspective What it brings to us, it it begins to show to us where the heart of the matter lies. And I've been attacking this problem in so many different ways, trying to really get down to it. And again, I I think it's so cliche that now it's no longer cliche. It's just what my preaching is all about these days. But at the end of the day, it's all about relationship. And in relationship, in relationship, it's never about right and wrong. In relationship, it's not about success and failure. In relationship, it's either about intimacy or distance. It's about, it's about being close or being far. It's, it's, it's not in terms of right and wrong. It's in terms of knowing one another, how close you are. When I think of my friends... Believe it or not, I have some friends. Um, When I think of my friends, I never define my relationship with my friends based on what they can give me or based on what I can give them. I don't know about you, but that's how it works for me. When someone's my friend, I'm I'm not defining how close we are as friends based on what kind of job they have, based on their income, based on, based on anything that they can, they can give to me. I don't, I don't base it on the kind of gifts that I get from them, the kind of parties we go to, the kind of events we attend, or, or it, how often we see each other. That's not how I base my relationship with my friends. I base my relationship with my friends on how close we are, how tight are we, have we shared, have we talked, have we gotten together where we just, you know, we just talk about random stuff. I mean, my wife makes fun of me all the time because I, I'm texting my friends. I, and my, my best friend, I text them like on a day-to-day basis. And, and she makes fun of me. She's like, you text him more than you text me. And, it's, and it, at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with my friendship with my friend Kevin, whether it's a success or not. We're just, we're friends and it's a good friendship because we're close. Your relationship with God is far more important if you're a good, than if you're a good person. Your relationship with God is far more important than if you're a bad person. Your relationship and closeness with the Lord is far more important than anything, whether you're a good person or a bad person. I think this is the kind of shift that we need to begin to make because the the, the situation is the same, but the process in which we pull ourselves up out of it is very different. See, for, for many of us, when we read the story of this woman, and again, the woman we're talking about is the city of Jerusalem, so please, it's not about women and men. It's not a gender thing. What it is is, is that as we look at this woman, we understand she is on the bottom. She is in the pits. She is at the lowest of lows. All of her, the people that she cared about have left her, have left her to die and to rot, to be naked and alone, and she is t- completely separated from her community. 
And, and the way in which we counsel this woman, the way in which we tell her how she's supposed to get back on the right track is very key to understanding our faith. If you're counseling to this woman, it's like, hey, you just need to turn away from your sins. Stop doing what you're doing. And, and just start doing the right thing. Then that response describes the faith you have in the Lord. Let me, let me, let me break this down a little bit more. The way in which you're going to respond to this woman who is on the bottom of her barrel, who is, is at the lowest of lows, will essentially dictate the way you view the Lord. See, if your response to her is, you need, to, you need to get into shape, you need to fix it yourself, you need to do it, then your faith will look that way. Meaning, in order for me to be in right standing with God, I need to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Because that's the way I get into right standing with God, is if I do the right thing. The way that I would approach leading to this woman is for her to surrender her whole life to the Lord. It's for her to give her life to God. That she would sacrifice her life to him. It's very different. Again, it may look exactly the same way. But these, it's this small little nuance that changes the game. See, at one end, one side is saying, okay, your life is at the very bottom, so do the right thing and it's all going to work out. At the other end, it's this attitude of surrender and submission, saying, Lord, my life is yours. I am all yours. There's a big difference. And it begins with repentance. And I think in our culture, we don't understand repentance the way we're supposed to understand repentance because we've strayed away from part A of repentance. Repentance is a twofold thing, and this is what we're going to talk about a lot. But the book of Lamentations, it focuses a lot about part A. We, as, as Christians, as New Testament believers, we focus a lot on part B. But part A of repentance is very important. Part B is something you probably understand. It's turning away from your wicked ways. It's, it's turning that new leaf. It, it's, it's by the fact that you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that now you no longer live in sin, but now you can live in the holiness of God. And so go and be free and do what you, what, what you like to do. Love one another, and it's what we've been talking about. That's the other side of repentance. It's that turning away. But there's a first part of repentance. It's confession. Confession. And this is where we really suck. We're not good at this. Because we are afraid to really face head on what we've done and how bad we are. We're really good at making sure that when we, when we find that we're doing something bad, we, we try to turn away. And we're really good about trying to do that. But we're really bad about really noticing what we do wrong. And, and recognizing, identifying, this is what I'm doing wrong. This is, this is the problem. Confession is what this woman does. So let's continue in the book of Lamentations. Verse 18. This is the, the words of this woman who is at the bottom of her barrel. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. This woman is repenting, but she's confessing. See, what she's doing here in verse 18 through 20, what she's doing is she's explaining and she's expressing to God and, and telling people and she's making it very verbal. She's explaining the Lord is in the right to let me go through this. God is in the right to let me go through this because I have been treacherous. I have been doing wrong. And she goes even more so and, and, and being like, the lovers that I have, they've all left me. The people that I've trusted and I thought that they had the answers, none of them had the answers. So I'm in distress. Lord, save me. This is an aspect of our faith, of our belief system that we need to come to terms with and understand that has to be a part of our faith. What happens when you don't confess is that you begin to believe a truth 
that twists into a lie. When you fail to confess, you begin to believe a truth that you twist into a lie. And that truth is this, that God is good. That it, the truth is that God is good. God is good and God is all-powerful. These are good truths that when we're on cloud nine, when we're doing well, that we can believe with all of our heart. When you're, when you're getting that promotion, when you're getting that raise, when, you're, when your you know, wife is pregnant, and when you, when you meet the, the love of your life, when you, when you have a lot of friends and, and someone says God is good, you're like, amen, God is good. You know, when you buy that new car, you know, you, you, have, you have things flowing in the correct way, and someone says the truth of God is good and God is all-powerful, we are the first to say amen. But there's something that happens. It's when the bad times come. It's when the pain comes. When the troubles come. And someone says God is good. That's where we begin to say, if God is good, how could he let me go through this? If God is good, how dare he let me be this low? If God is good, why doesn't he save me? If God is so good, then why is everything collapsing? Why is everything falling apart? Why why is everything I care about just crumbling to the ground? How dare you say God is good? There is no God. God is dead. See, that truth that we once believed so, so readily, so, so much when, when things are going well, becomes a lie that we twist it and we turn it. What confession does so aptly, so strong, so, so correctly is it refocuses our perspective. Oh, it was me. I'm the one who failed. I'm the one who did wrong. I'm the one who messed this all up. And again, this is where I need you to really understand the nuance of it all. This is not blaming yourself. This woman should not be blaming herself for the calamity that's in her life. It's not blaming herself, but it's understanding that she's been distant from God. She's been far away from her, from her betrothed. That the city of Jerusalem, that the people, the Israelites, should have been connectly close to the one true God. That it really was where God looked at Israel. God looked at these people and said, you are mine and I am yours. That, that, I, that you are my chosen people and I will make covenant with you. I will, I will watch over you all of your days. I will watch you no matter what. I will make you into a great nation. I will give you this land. And Israel's, again, on cloud nine, like, oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, we are in covenant with you. We are together with you. We are united with you forever and ever and ever. God is good. And the Israelites are like, all the time. And they're like, all the time, God is good. That's what they're saying. Because they're winning their battles. They're doing the right thing. You know, their, their city is growing under King David. The, the temple and everything is being built and everything is being awesome. It's great. God is good. But what they end up doing is this. God is good, but let me dabble in some idolatry. God is good, but you know what? Let me look at the other things that the world has to offer to me. Let me look at some, uh, let me look at some of this. Let me look at some of that. Yeah, God, you are mine and I am yours, but you know what? There's a, there's a good-looking guy over here, and, and he brings a lot of success. Oh, and there's another one over there. There's another one over there and there. And so come, come into my chambers. Come and lie with me. Come and be with me. And again, God is on the sidelines. And so when destruction and calamity comes, again, from the perspective of the outsider, it's like, oh, the Lord is the one who is destroying the house, and he's stomping all over everything, and he's, he's turning up the tables because you've cheated on him. And absolutely right, that is how you can see it. But I think there's a story before that. There was a break in relationship that comes before all the actions. This woman, her repentance, the reason why it becomes so clear is that after this calamity, it's not a repentance on the kind that is just saying, Lord, I messed up, I'll do better. Lord, I failed, I'll I'll do right this time. Lord, it's I need you. I need you. Church, there's a difference when you repent 
and you confess. When you made a big mistake, there's a difference between just trying to get to the punchline and saying, oh, I messed up this time, Lord, I'll do better next time, compared to, Lord, I messed up and I need you. I need you. I can't fix this. I can't make this right on my own. Only you can save me. See, the person who's sitting here and saying, Lord, I messed up, but I'll fix it, they don't need a savior. They need more time. They need more resources. They need more effort. They need more ability. They need more luck. Then they'll be saved. The person here that's saying, Lord, I need you. I messed up, and only you can save me. That's the kind of person that's experiencing real repentance. That's the kind of uh, person that's experiencing real confession by saying, only by you can I be saved. On Good Friday, we, we worship together, and, and I recommend this Good Friday that's coming up um, later in the spring, that you would all come. And Good Friday service is a little bit different because it's, it's more somber. It's more lamenting. It's more of that grieving spirit. And what Good Friday is, is this. We look at the cross, and yes, the blame is on us. The, the, res- the, the reason why Jesus died is because of us. But there are times even for me on Good Friday service, I look at the cross and I, I kind of look at it and there's no emotions in me. There's no feeling in me. And I just look at it and I'm like, yeah, Jesus died. Jesus died. That's great. Because why? Oh yeah, three days later, we're going to be here in the same room singing songs and talking about Easter, talking about how good God is because he's raised from the dead. And so honestly, Good Friday, like, what's the point? Jesus died for me. He's going to get raised again. God is good, right? So Jesus dies and he's, he's raised again. So it's all, at the end of the day, the story all works out. So Good Friday. That's why we call it good, right? Because Jesus is raised from the dead. No. The reason why we call it Good Friday is because when we look at the cross, we know that it's us that's supposed to be on that cross, dying, breathing for life. We know that it's, it should be me. That instead of the perfect man, instead of the one who had never sinned, who had no reason to be killed, who had not done anything wrong, if anyone in this world did not deserve a single bad thing to happen to them, it was Jesus. Because he didn't do anything wrong. So when we talk about the righteousness and justice of God, and we look at the cross, we should say there is something unjust about that. Because he didn't deserve to die. I did. I deserve to die. I deserve to be there on the cross. Why is he on the cross? Why is he dying for me? It's in that confession that looking at the cross and saying, Lord, it should have been me. I'm the one that deserved to die. That it's in that confession of confessing and saying, Lord, I can't do this life without you. And knowing that Jesus died for you because he wants to be close to you. Because he wants to be near to you. He wants to be in your life. You talk about being romantic. That's the most romantic thing that someone could do for you is lay down their life for you. That Jesus wanting you, desiring you so much, seeing you in your sin, seeing you in your filth, seeing a woman like this just be com- completely abandoned and left by everyone. Jesus looks at this woman, Jesus looks at you and at me in our filth, in our sin, in all of our wretchedness and says, I want you, I desire you, I want you to be in my life. And so he dies for us. Your response to that is confession. See, your response to Jesus laying down his life for you is confession because if you dare say and look at Jesus hanging on the cross for your sin and my sin and says, I'll do better, I'll work harder, I'll do the right thing, what good is that? Because no matter how hard you work, Jesus still needs to die for you because of how wretched you are, how broken you are. The response needs to be true confession which says, Lord, I am nothing without you. So when we look at the cross, we say, thank you. Thank you for dying for me because I'm the one that deserves death, not you. I think there comes a point where we need to realize that we are this woman, that we have many other loves in our lives, 
Like, yeah, we, God is our husband. God is our, our, our partner. He's our, our spouse, and we love him very much, and, and, and we're very excited to live all of eternity with him in heaven, and we're very excited to, to have that white picket fence in heaven and, and, and to live with God forever. We're very excited about that. But while we're here on this earth, we are constantly, constantly having our eyes wander and stray away from him, constantly looking at other things that are distracting us. I think there comes a point where we need to confess. And maybe we're not there yet. Maybe, maybe you're so happy with life. Maybe you're on that cloud nine that when I say God is good, you're like, amen. And, and what you mean when you're amen, you're like, he's a, he's a great roommate. God is a great roommate because I love having him around. I love having him just because just he's so funny. He's so fun. What I think needs to happen is, is God needs to stop being your roommate. He needs to start living with you. He needs to be your soulmate. God needs to stop being your roommate, someone that you cohabitate with, someone that you maybe even pay rent to, someone that you're just, you're just giving him all the resources because he, he, he's your roommate and you need to do that for him, to someone that he's your soulmate. That without him, you wouldn't be able to live. Because what I know is this, is if Jesus is your soulmate, if God is the one that, that he's got you no matter what, this woman wouldn't be in so much distress. This woman's in distress because she's alone. She's crying in her pillow. All of her lovers have left. All of her friends are betraying and backstabbing her. But if she has God with her, right by her side, if she has Jesus next to her, holding her, comforting her, even through the worst times of her life, that she can grab onto Jesus, hold on to him and say, Lord, I need you right now. And it's in that that intimacy with God is found. That it's in that that we can begin to hear his voice. We can begin to hear his whispers. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to hear God audibly necessarily, but I want to hear his whispers. I want to hear him in the intimacy of him holding me when I'm crying my eyes out because life is just too hard. It's too much stress. It's too much pressure that while I'm holding him, God can hold me back and he can say, I love you. I care about you. I want you. Church, I, my call to you is, is to confess your sins. And not in a, a stance of, I'll fix it. Lord, these are my sins and I'll do better. But you confess your sins and say, Lord, I messed up. Lord, I'm, I'm wretched and I need you. Would you come and meet me? I believe wholeheartedly that if that's our prayer, that God will meet us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the book of Lamentations, a book that talks about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Lord, that the, the Babylonians came in and just destroyed everything. And Lord, we don't even know what that's like. And yet, Lord, from this we can learn the importance of repentance the importance of your holiness, the importance of your goodness, that you love us despite all of our failures. Father, I pray that in our darkest times that we would reach out to you, we would call out to you, knowing that you are a good God who loves us and cares about us. And so in those dark times, would you hold us? Would you love us and comfort us? Father, I pray for this church. I pray for all of their, their problems. I pray for all of their needs, that, Lord, they would not just fix it themselves. They would not become self-sufficient, but instead they would become dependent on you and you alone. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, I thank you for being such a loving God, for desiring us so much that you would want to send your son to die for us. God, that while we deserve death, that while we deserve nothing more than to pay for the sins that we've committed, that you paid the penalty for us. And so, Father, we thank you. But, Lord, we cry out to you saying we need you because our lives are still broken, that we still go through so much calamity. And so, Father, I pray that in our darkest of times that we would cling on to you, hold on to you, and, Lord, that you would whisper in our ears that you love us. So, Father, I pray for our church that no matter what turmoil we go through, that we would always know that our call is to be intimate with you and close to you. 
that in the darkest times that we would know that you are God and you are good. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.